Hey YouTubers and welcome back to my YouTube channel Master That English where we understand, analyze and interpret the important texts and concepts that may be part of your English curriculum. Our topic for today is the study of the periodical essays with special reference to the Spectator Club. So get your pens and notepads ready because here we go. Okay. The periodical essay is an essential literary form of prose of the 18th century. Although, the first question that may come to our mind is, how did the periodical essays become popular? Hmm, the answer lies in the rise of the new class of people, that is, the middle class. This middle class always aspired to rise like the rich and affluent aristocratic class. They also had the desire to dress up and behave like the gentlemen in the society. But the question is, how was it possible for them to achieve this goal? The solution to this problem was through the periodicals. As in these periodicals, the writer was like a stylist, providing all the information regarding the various aspects of life. Some of these aspects are the accurate and deep understanding about the gentlemanly code of conduct the latest fashion trends, the popular social events, mannerism of the elite class, topics of social debates, and most importantly, encouraging women to read and educate themselves. That brings us to our next question, which is, why did the periodical essays become so popular? They were popular mainly because of the simple expression that was used in the periodical. It was an ordinary day-to-day -day expression that anybody would use in their common usage, which is why it was very easy to understand the language of the periodicals. The second aspect was it was very entertaining, since you learnt about so many things around your social environment. That is the other reason why these periodicals were also called light literature. And the last feature about these periodicals was that they were didactic. So they were informing and instructing the public by generating awareness about what was happening around them and what was that that they need to reform in their behavior. So altogether, the objective of the periodical was to reform and guide the public and teach the right mannerism and code of conduct. Let us now shift our attention to the next essential thing that you need to know regarding the periodical essays, which is, in whose reign did the periodical essays become popular in the 18th century? The answer is Queen Anne. She reigned from 1702 to 1714. Well, that was enriching. Let's move on to the next question, which is, which writer initially popularized the periodical essays in the 18th century. This initial contribution was given by none other than Daniel Defoe and the periodical that he wrote was the review. What is interesting about this periodical is that it also had a fictitious club called the Scandalous Club. What did this Scandalous Club do? It provided answers to all the questions that the public had in their mind. So they were fictional characters and these fictional characters would talk about and discuss about all the things that the society would be curious about. In fact, Daniel Defoe himself has elaborated these domains as Here are questions in divinity, morality, love, state, war, trade, language, poetry, marriage, etc. The overall objective of this periodical was to reform the society, which is probably the reason why it was not that popular as many of the periodicals during the 18th century. So let's just shift our attention to the periodical that was very popular. But before that, let me give you a fun fact about Daniel Defoe. Do you know that Daniel Defoe is the father of novel writing and he has also popularized adventure novels such as Robinson Crusoe. Interesting, ain't it? Let us now find out 
who were the people who really popularized the periodical essays in the 18th century. This one was a joint endeavor of two friends, Joseph Addison and Richard Steele. What is interesting about their friendship is that both of them shared the same ideological beliefs in many domains, such as they both had the same political aspiration, as both of them were members of the political party Whigs, which was going against the principles of the king of the time. The second thing that they had in common was that they had the similar literary taste as well, as both of them were members of a club called the Kit Kat Club, which was a popular literary club in those days. In these clubs, individuals would sit, eat and discuss about the common ideological beliefs that they share in common. What is interesting about this club is that the name has been derived not from a chocolate that we eat today, but a mutton pie. Let us now discuss about the periodical essays that they wrote together. What is unique about these periodical essays is that there are three significant features about these periodicals. Each periodical comprised of a lot of essays. Each essay was published independently through weekly publication and the length of these essays was from two to four pages. The two essays that they are most famously known for, the first one is Tatler that was published from the year 1709 to 1711 and the days in which it was published was Tuesday, Thursday and Saturday. And the most popular one is The Spectator that was published from 1711 to 1712. This was a daily publication. Let us now shift our attention to the modification the periodical essays went through with the passage of time. That brings us to our next question, which is, how did the periodicals change in the latter half of the 18th century? This change is seen as in the mid-half of the 18th century, periodical essays now became a segment of the newspapers. So they were no longer independently published. And the person who has popularized this trend is the writer Samuel Johnson. His periodical, The Idler, was a part of the newspaper called The Universal Chronicle, which was from 1758 to 1760. And the number of essays that were published in The Idler were 103 essays. Let us now understand the other essential thing. Did the length of the essay also change with time? Of course they did. And you can notice this change in the work of Oliver Goldsmith called The Citizen of the World, which is a part of a daily journal called The Public Ledger from 1760 to 61. What is interesting about this particular work is that in this work there are a collection of letters. And in this work, the fictitious character is a Chinese man who critiqued the 18th century society in England. That brings us to the end of the first segment, which was mainly dealing with the understanding of the growth of the periodical essays. Who were the people who were benefiting with these essays? Why were they popular? And how was the growth of the periodical essays taking shape with the passage of time? So now, let us shift our attention to the next segment. In this segment, we shall analyze a periodical written by Richard Steele in the periodical The Spectator. So let's begin. The periodical that we are going to study is essay number two, which is called The Spectator Club. So let's begin. The first question that we need to understand is, what is The Spectator Club? Do you remember? In the starting of the lecture, I told you that Daniel Defoe in his periodical, The Review, also had a fictitious club called The Scandalous Club. Similarly, even in The Spectator, Richard Steele and Edison came up with the fictitious club that was called The Spectator Club. In this club, there were altogether six members that have been described in this essay. So we are going to understand each and every character that has been described. Before we do that, we need to come across our next question, which is, what is the unique feature about the starting of the periodical essay? What's interesting about each essay that is written in The Spectator is the use of motto, 
before the essay begins. What is a motto? A motto usually is a kind of reference statement that you take up from an ancient writer. In this particular essay, you notice that the reference has been taken from the work of a Roman poet called Juvenal. And the lines have been taken from his work, Satire. These are Latin lines, which translate into English as Six more at least join their consenting voice. To understand the meaning behind these lines, it is important to come across our next question, which is, what was the purpose of the motto in the periodical? The purpose was that the foreign reference was used to provide an idea about the content of the essay. So it is a way of giving you a brief idea about what the work is going to discuss about. In today's reference, you can call it a bit like a poster. Before you go for a movie, you notice that the poster gives you an idea about what kind of content will be there in the movie or a trailer. So the lines are very important because they decide the theme inside the work. So in this essay, the writer is using the voices of the six different characters who are presenting a true picture of the 18th century society. And because of this honest sketch of the characters, there is also an ironic tone of expression noticed in the description of the characters. That brings us to our next question, which is, do you know the first writer in England to represent the first honest character sketch of the society? Well, for this answer, we need to go way back to 14th century. And this writer is none other than the father of English literature. Yes, it is Geoffrey Chaucer, who is well known for representing the true image of the society in his work, Prologue to the Canterbury Tales. Let us now understand how to steal benefit the society in the honest character sketch of the characters. Steel is being honest and with this honesty, he is able to develop an ironic tone. And this ironic tone helps to identify the flaws in the behavior of the individuals from various fields. And these individuals are analyzed in two levels. In the first level, we analyze the surface appearance of the character, which is by the background of the individual, mainly his social status. And the second layer is identified as the true character of the individual, which can be analyzed through the behavior of that individual, how that individual interacts with people, how he communicates with them. This is what is the true representation of his personality. And that is exactly what we are going to do here in the character sketches of the people mentioned in the Spectator Club. So let's begin with the very first character. Please welcome Sir Roger de Coverley. His social status is that he belongs to an aristocratic background. For an aristocratic person, there is one chief aspect that determines his reputation. That is, his history or his legacy. And this can be analyzed on three domains. The place that he hails from, the designation that he holds, and the family background. So let's analyze these three things. You notice that he hails from the place called Worcestershire, which is not just an ordinary place in the map, but it is actually a place which is well known for its real estate value. And that is what makes this place a land of prosperity. The second is the title Sir added to his name. In the 18th century, the title Sir was only used by those influential people who had a name and recognition for themselves. A part of his name and recognition has been claimed by his family legacy, as his great-grandfather was the founder of the traditional art, country dance. So you notice that he's just not an ordinary person who has risen all of a sudden into fame and glory. There has been a history because of which his name still has importance today. Let us now talk about his other good aspects that make him popular. 
the very first thing that you notice about him, that he is a person with very jovial nature. You notice that he doesn't have any intention to harm people around him. He's so familiar, in fact, that he even calls his servants by their names. You notice that he is also interested in socializing the fact that he is belonging to the aristocratic background. And the place he mostly socializes in is a place called Soho Square. It's almost like a place where you like to go for drinks and interact with high people, etc. The next thing about him is that he is also holding influential positions, such as he is the justice of the quorum. That means that he has a place where he is contributing in one way or the other. Not only that, but he also has awareness about the current rules and regulation that are imposed by the government. Such as one of the things mentioned in the essay about him is that he has the knowledge about the Game Act, which was a kind of law which was mainly to protect the killing of the birds in 1831. Let us now closely observe Roger D. Coverley's behavior. Hmm. This can be noticed by his anger management issues, as he lacks tolerance power and does not tolerate disrespect from people who try to, in a way, ridicule him and make fun of him. You can notice this in the essay, as there is an episode represented there in which he kicks a person named Bully Dawson. And Bully Dawson here is a kind of troublemaker who just likes to tease people, trouble them and have fun. So in a way, Roger T. Coverley lacks maturity when it comes to his tolerance power. He is offended when Bully Dawson calls him a youngster outside a coffee house. In here, the reference of the place coffee house is very important. Because Coffee House was a place where intellectual discussions would take place in the 18th century. And the fact that he was kicking Bully Dawson in the public place, that too outside a coffee house, indicates that he doesn't want others to follow his example. The next limitation in his behavior is that he requires emotional support. He has just been through a breakup with a widow and... You notice that the effect of that breakup is still there on him because he doesn't care in dressing up well. He's still wearing the old-fashioned dress that was in vogue at one point of time. You can notice this by the same doublet and coat that he continues to wear. That means he is only dressing to impress. And he is 56 years old. So he doesn't really have... A stability in his life till now. And the problems don't end there because he also likes to be in the company of people with bad reputation. Such as the first person mentioned in the essay is Lord Rochester, who is by nature a Casanova and likes to have many affairs with women. Hi pretty lady. And the second person mentioned in the essay is Sir George Itheridge, who is by nature an opportunist, who has bought his knighthood just to marry a widow. You can achieve anything with money. Let us now shift our attention to the next character in the Spectator Club. This man has a profession of a power-driven authority. He is a lawyer a member of the inner temple. What is interesting about him is the very unusual taste he has in the things that he likes to read. As he is only fond of reading the ancient writers such as Aristotle and Longinus, he wants to understand the way in which you can improve the society by only understanding their philosophical views. He doesn't want to understand the new ideas that are given by the lawyers of the current day society, such as Littleton and Cook, who are successful people. And one should also try to know about the things the modern day people are talking about. So this shows his neglect towards the ideologies of the current day society. The next thing you notice is that he also lacks 
firm decision-making ability and social awareness. This is noticed by the way in which he only follows the directions of his parents and doesn't know how to do or follow things on his own when it comes to his profession. You can notice this by the way in which his parents are the ones who are trying and taking the effort to build his career. Sunny, I will send you more cases of marriage and leases. I'm not interested in pursuing these cases. I'm interested in social ideals of Demotinus and Tully. So you notice that he's completely inconsiderate towards the events that are taking place in his social scenario. He wants to know the aspects of ancient, but are the values and concepts given by these administrators helping you in the present day issues? If you can't apply the knowledge you learn in your current day scenarios, you hold no chance of growth. And this is what you notice in this particular lawyer, that his parents want to know about what is happening around the world and what are the type of cases that lawyers are fighting for. But the son is completely inconsiderate. He has no interest in social welfare. The only thing that he is interested in is social entertainment, like shows in the Rose Theatre. He just wants to go and enjoy himself. And this can be seen that he, instead of being involved in legal matters, he has more time to groom himself for social entertainment. He loves to wear polished shoes and stylized wigs so that he can look perfect to the T and go and showcase himself as a very fashionable man where he should be focusing on his studies and trying to help the society in understanding and resolving their issues. Let us now move to the next character in the Spectator Club. This individual is a businessman by profession and his name is Sir Andrew Freeport. What is interesting about this man is that he is the only person in the spectator group who is a self-made man and is representative of the rising middle class in the capital city, London. He has done everything on his own. What is interesting and unique about him is in the very next question, which is, why is the designation of Sir Andrew Freeport different from Sir Roger D. Coverley? Well, let us hear it from Sir Andrew Freeport himself. I have earned everything on my own credibility. I didn't have any legacy like Sir Roger D. Coverley. And that's interesting. Because you can notice that he has some set of strong skills because of which he has been able to live an independent life of his own. This is noticed by his hard-working attitude and never say, never die spirit. Which is why he has been described with the adjective indefatigable industry. He also has a logical bent of mind because of which he can take the right decisions and make profit for himself, which is why he has strong reason. And also, he considers time to be his teacher because it is only time that has helped him to improve his skills and thereby evolve and improve himself. Let us move on to our next question, which is, from which trade is he making money as a merchant? Well, this source of income is coming from the sea. And it is interesting to see how he describes the sea as the British common. Because everybody has access to the sea. So anyone can earn money without paying any tax. So this is an opportunity that is open to everyone. His only limitation is noticed in his approach towards life that is always based on profit and loss. And yes, he always wants to earn the profit in this philosophy. So you notice that in all his ideological beliefs, he only tries to promote trade. 
let us notice his social manipulation. He feels that the nation can grow only when you are promoting trade and not war. Not only in his social manipulation concepts, but also in his personal manipulation ideologies, you notice that he has and does promote a miserly philosophy towards life. He has a very good motto in which he truly believes, which is, a penny saved is a penny got. That means, the more you keep holding and saving, those little pennies are going to turn into pounds. So keep saving so that you can benefit more and more in life. Let us now proceed to the fourth character in the Spectator Club. This individual by profession is from the army and enjoys the reputation of a courageous man. Take a look at his modest spirit. I don't boast about my achievements. If I have done something worthwhile or good, the world will appreciate it on their own. It is commendable to appreciate his modest temperament. But this very modest attitude acted as a hindrance in his path of progress. As he is not able to project his potential to the influential people like his commander. And if you're working so hard, you should talk about your contribution. Time to move on to our next character. Who is an elite socialite? This individual is well appreciated for his grooming and mannerism. And he's also aware of the latest fashion and social gossip. I'm so well groomed, you can't even tell my age. Ladies love me, because I know everything about everyone. His only limitation is that he is gaining popularity by spoiling the reputation of other people, mainly by circulating gossips. Rumour has it that the Duke of Monmouth is having affairs with many people. Oh dear. Okay, enough gossip. Time for the last member in the Spectator Club, who is by profession a clergyman. What's interesting about him is that he is a man of learning and he wants to use his knowledge for the good of mankind. He's the only humanitarian who believes in using his knowledge for the well-being of the society. He loves to read philosophy because philosophy helps him to understand man's purpose in life. And he also loves to read theology because theology helps him to understand the importance of God in life. Although there is another weak aspect related to him, not based on his habits, but based on his weak constitution. He does take care of his education, but he doesn't really take care of his physical health because of which he is unable to shoulder his responsibilities for the welfare of the humanity. And that is what is required for every individual, even in the current day scenario. We all need to be mentally and physically strong. That brings us to the end of this lecture. I hope you enjoyed the whole lecture as much as I enjoyed in making it for all of you. If you're new to this channel, please join the family and subscribe to the channel. If you feel this lecture was enriching, also give it a like. And to stay updated, don't forget to hit the bell icon. This is me, Karishma, signing off for now. I hope to see you soon in the next lecture. Do tell me in your comment section below what you feel was most interesting about this lecture. Until next time, this is me saying bye-bye to all of you. Take care and stay safe.